Uh, I was praying about, you know, I always pray about messages to bring on, on Sunday morning. And uh, God had been dealing with me for a little while to address a topic. Um, and it's really, it's a topic for the body. It's not, you know, sometimes we'll have, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll deal with reaching out and others and so forth. But this one is for inside the congregation. And I'm going to tell you, they ought to lock the doors because today we're going to talk about money. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. And somebody says, oh, here we go. Now listen, for those of you who know me for a long time, I don't, I don't, I don't, I rarely preach about money. Uh, I don't do it unless God tells me to. I never do it because I have to. Because the first thing is some people think when you start preaching about money, the first thing is some folks will think was, well, they must be, they must be hurting for money, etc. And we're not. We're not. We don't, we got money. We got money in the bank. Bills are paid. We want to do some stuff around the building. We got money. I, I, you've never heard me. I've never had to make, you know, take a special offering for this or for that or anything. We always had money. And we do now. Uh, so I'm not trying to get more money. You know, people say he's trying to get more money. I'm not trying to get more money out of anybody. In, in fact, some of you have, are, have blessed us. Some of you are very faithful in your giving. And we, we're thankful for that. This isn't about, this isn't about getting We've We've always felt, you know, money. The, the Bible says, it doesn't say the money is the root of all evil. It says the love of money is the root of all evil. And there's so much in the scripture, you know, Money and economy is as old as, you know, it goes way back. Buying and selling goes way, way back. And worship goes way, way back. And uh, the, the, uh, the Sunday and probably next couple Sundays, we're going to be dealing with this. Not because I want more money, but because I don't want you to miss your blessing in, in blessing God. Now, in this church, in this congregation... We have a, a box up on the piano and people bring their, their tithes and offerings and their, and their gifts to the church. Uh, and we prayed about that. We really prayed. There was been a couple times I really prayed about maybe, you know, most churches, they, they do the offering thing, you know, with a basket. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, when you don't, when we do it like we do it, you miss, there's something you can miss. Because when you bring an offering... See, I put that little sign there. And because when you bring an offering, what you're doing is you're worshiping God. Just like we, you know, have time and worship and music and raising our hands, that's worshiping God. Your offering, your giving is as much an act of worship as your singing. And it's not so much how much you give, but it's the heart that you have when you give it. So when you do it like we do, we kind of miss that, you know, praying over the offering. That's why I encourage when I talk to folks, pray for your offering. When you put an offering in the box, pray for it. Say, you're not giving it to me and you're not giving it to this church. We administer it, but you're giving it as unto the Lord. And, and you know, we as a, as a church, you know, we, we have, uh, you know, we have expenses and so forth. You know, as I said, God has met all our needs. Me and, and Brother uh, John and Brother Chuck, once a month we get together and we do the books and, and we, you know, write out checks. We, we from the very beginning of, our, of this church, back in 1991, almost 20 years ago, Rose and I determined that we were going to tithe for all the money that comes into this church to other ministries. And we've done that. And God has blessed us for that. Okay. Now, now we'll, we'll talk about that somewhere down the line. But what I want to deal with today is not so much the actual offering, but the heart, the attitude behind the offering, okay? Behind the giving. The very first act of worship in the Bible didn't come with music, didn't come with harps and trumpets and drums. That's worship. But the very first act of worship was not an act of music or singing, it was an act of sacrifice. In Genesis chapter 4, I wonder if you could turn there with me. And it's a story we all know. But we'll read it again. In Genesis chapter 4, and starting at verse 1. And Adam knew Eve, his wife. And she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. 
And she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. Now we know, and it's that these weren't the only two children that Adam and Eve had. They probably just had kids, you know, like every nine months or every year. They were replenishing, they were populating the earth. But these were the two oldest sons. And from the name that Eve gave to her eldest son Cain, she almost it's almost as though she felt like he was the one that was promised that would be the redeemer. Back in the last chapter, God promised that he... Uh, that the, the, the seed of the woman would bruise the seed of the serpent. And so Cain and Abel. Abel was a keeper of sheep and Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel he brought also of the firstlings of the flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. Now, you have two brothers. They're both bringing an offering of the, from the stuff that they, that they do. Abel was a... He kept sheep, and Cain was a farmer. And they brought stuff. Now, there's a lot involved here when you talk about the blood and so forth, and, and, and we're, we, we're not going to get into that in that kind of level. But all we're, all we're looking at here is when they brought their offering, what was their purpose for bringing a sacrifice? It should have been for worship. It should have been for worship. We don't know how Adam conveyed to his sons the necessity of bringing a sacrifice. We don't, you know, we're not given that information. But we know that they were aware of the fact that they needed to bring an offering to worship God. So, Abel brought a lamb, a living being, a living creature, shed its blood. And I can guarantee you that the lamb he brought was not like a, one that limped. It wasn't like the second. It wasn't like one of the ones that wasn't good for anything else. He brought the best that he could bring. And he offered it as, unto God as a worship offering. And God accepted his offering. I'm sure when Cain went out and started picking vegetables and stuff to bring to God, I'm sure he picked the best he had. And he brought it to God. God didn't have respect for his offering. And read with, with me why. The Lord said to Cain in verse 6, Why are you wroth or angry? And why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, shall you not be accepted? If you do well, Cain, I'll accept your offering. What's he talking about here? If we read this, and again, if you really get into the, to the depth of it, there is an attitude difference. It's almost as though Cain brought the stuff that he grew to show God what a good job he did and show hey, God, look at my stuff. I'm giving it to you. Abel took a life that he could not give. And he shed blood. Because without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. And he brought this offering unto God. And it's an attitude. It's the internal. When you bring, when you bring an offering to the box, when you, when, you, when you give to church or give to a ministry or give to a charity, what is your purpose? What's your reason? What's your attitude? Where's your heart? When we start talking about money and giving an offering, it begins with your heart. It begins with your attitude as to why you're doing it. Cain, when God said, no thanks Cain, instead of getting on his face and saying, oh God, where have I missed it? Where have I gone wrong? Where have I... Have I? Instead of that, he got angry. God, how dare you not accept my offering? Have you ever felt that way? God told Cain, he said, if you do well, you'll be accepted. 
And if you do not will, sin lies at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and you shall rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field, what happened? Cain rose up and slew his brother. Now again, there's a whole lot, there's so much in this passage that we could deal with. But today, I just want to deal with the attitude issue about giving. There's a lot of folks, especially folks who've been raised in church, that think they got to give we well, you know, I just, I got to give. I got to make my own. When I was a kid, I went to a church and they gave you them envelopes. And it was like for each week. You know, different colors. I was a little kid, I liked all the colors, you know. <laughs> but then, I got a little older, I realized it was like each week. And they had the date on it. This is your date. And they would have one for the church and one for the offering for this. And they would have like about three or four offerings. And they printed everybody's. Every couple months, you would get a thing, and it would have everybody's name and how much they gave. And this one up here would give like, you know, $400. This was a long time ago. $400. And this one down here was like five bucks. And the people down here, they were like, oh. That's, that's not, listen, your giving isn't about what people know you give. It's about worship of God. Okay? Now, I don't want to get bogged down in this part. I want, I want to turn a little bit more. L look over to Genesis chapter 14. And again, we're just skimming through a little bit. But Genesis chapter 14. And we'll start reading at verse 17. Now, this is the story of Abraham, or Abram, just before his name was changed. And if you remember the story, Abram's nephew, Lot, decided to live in Sodom. Not a very good decision. He decided to live in Sodom. And when he decided to live there, uh, there were some kings that came and conquered Sodom. And they took Lot captive and all the people from Sodom captive. And Abram got his men together and rose up and had a miraculous victory over the, over the enemy kings. And he brought the people back and brought the stuff back. And when he came back, it says, And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return of the slaughter of Chedorlaomer. This is in verse 17. And of the kings that were with him at the valley of Shaveh, which is at the king's deal. And another king came out named Melchizedek. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. Now for those of you who were here, we were going through the book of Genesis. We're still going through the book of Genesis. But our studies in the book of Genesis, we dealt again with this in depth. But we see here a picture of two kings. The king of Sodom, whose name uh, I don't believe is given. And the king of Salem, or the king of peace. Melchizedek is his name. Melchizedek is a very important name. If you turn to the book of Hebrews and read through there, it talks about Jesus is a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. It says that he's the king of Salem or the king of peace. That's what the word Salem means. And actually, this is the, 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 the place that eventually became Jerusalem. So Melchizedek was the king of Jerusalem. He brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the Most High God, which has delivered your enemies into your hand. What this Melchizedek came to do as a high priest, now you know, a, high pri a priest is somebody that goes between man and God. He's like the intercessor in, in between. So here's these two kings. The king of Sodom comes out. We're going to read about him in a minute. And here comes the king of, uh, of, of peace, the king of Jerusalem, Melchizedek, of the Most High God. And what does he do? He blesses, he brings Abram bread and wine, which is a, a type and a symbol of what? Communion. The body and blood of Jesus Christ. This was thousands of years before Jesus walked the earth. But he brought forth bread and wine, and he blessed Abram of the Most High God. He said he blessed Abram, and he blessed the Most High God. So here's this high priest ministering to Abram, ministering to God, when Abram comes back from the great victory. And it says in verse 20 that Abram gave him tithes of all. This is before the law, because when you start talking about tithing, people say, oh, I the Old Testament law. This is before the law. Abram worshipped 
God. The high priest came to him. He worshipped God and how did he do it? There was no music playing. Of all the stuff that he got from that great victory, most people, most generals, if they go conquer a city and have a great victory, they take all the stuff with them. But before Abram took any of it, he took a tenth of it and he gave it to the priest. See, he wasn't giving it to the priest, he was giving it to the Lord. He was giving it as a worship offering to the Lord. Because he was giving God glory, because he realized the only reason he had the victory over those five kings is because God gave it to him. If you read through this scripture, and we'll talk about it more later as we go on uh, in the next week or so, that if, you know, the, the tithe in the Old Testament was acknowledging that everything we have comes from Him. If you have a good job and you're making money, it's because of Him. If you've invested good and if, you, if you've done good on your investments, it's because of Him. Whatever you have, whatever wealth you have, be it little or much, you have it because of Him. And what He expects of us to do as believers in Jesus Christ, He expects us to worship Him and acknowledge the fact that everything we have comes from Him. And he wants us to do it by giving him that first. He doesn't ask for a dollar amount. He asks for a percentage. Tithe means tenth. I'm glad they clapped before. <laughs> tithe means tenth. Well, I could never do that. I couldn't afford to do that. Let me tell you something. I've learned this personally and as, as this, this congregation. I can't afford not to do it. And again, please remember, I'm not saying this because I want you to give more money because we don't have enough money. I, I, I've, I've dealt with that. This is because this is your blessing. He was blessed. God blessed him and he blessed God back. And the other 90%? Read on a little bit more. Verse 21, And the king of Sodom said unto Abram, Give me the persons and you can keep all the stuff. Now if that would have been one of us, we would have said, Hey, praise the Lord, I'm going to keep it anyhow. <laughs> but listen to what Abram said. He says, I have lifted up my hand unto the Lord, the Most High God, the possessor of heaven and earth. Listen, we repeat that, the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth that I will not take from a thread even to a shoe latchet, and that I will not take anything that is yours, lest you should say, I have made Abram rich. Listen, it's the love of money that's the root of all evil. It's when we start getting, loving money so much, we'll take, we'll take money off of anybody for anything. Abram had all this stuff of all the city of Sodom, and he could have had it all, but he says, I'm not taking anything off of you, because my God makes me wealthy. You don't make me wealthy. I don't have to play the lottery to get wealthy. That's just a sucker's game anyhow. I don't have to I don't have to go out. I don't have to go out. Listen, it's God that gives me wealth and he'll give it to me his way. He ain't going to give it to me by taking it from somebody else. So we see this picture of Abram. I knew it would be quiet this morning, that's all right. We see this picture of Abram offering a tenth of all the stuff that he, he could have kept every penny of it. But he says, now I'm not, I'm not going to let this king of Sodom say he gave this to me. You take your stuff back. I'm just going to just pay the guys that, that fought the battle, and I'm giving this tenth to my God because it's his. Okay? Now, again, so much more in that, uh, in that passage. I'm just, I'm just skimming through this. I want you to turn with me to another passage. Look over in Isaiah chapter 2. Uh, and look at verse uh, well pastor messed up
It's a place where, and maybe you can help me. It's, it's, it, and, and, and if somebody has a concordance, maybe you can help me. But it's the place where God says through the prophet Isaiah, and I apologize for that. I, I, I put the wrong number down. It's a place where Isaiah says through the prophet of, of Isaiah, the, the prophet Isaiah, he says, you know what? Your worship of me is a stench in my nostrils. If somebody, you know, somebody can find that. He said, he, he, he said, I, I don't, I don't want, I don't, I don't want to hear your music anymore. Your new moons and your feasts and all the things that, all this, all this worship that you talk about. You, know, you, you, you go through the motions. If your heart isn't right, if your heart isn't right, your worship is not acceptable. Turn the, turn the amps off. Unplug the microphones. How much of what passes for worship, we can listen to it, we hear it. Great worship songs, great worship music. How much of it is being given as unto the Lord as an act of worship? And how much of it is being played because it sounds good and it makes people dance. Yes. We'll turn there. But I know it was in Isaiah, but Amos 5.21, that's, that sounds pretty good too. <laughs> I know Amos. Amos always has some good stuff. Uh, we'll check that out. It's terrible when I make notes and I put the wrong, and I put the wrong stuff down. It's just... It, Say 5 and 21. Okay. Amos chapter 5 and verse 21. Okay, yeah, well this will do. <laughs> this will do. The Lord speaks through Amos. He says, I hate, I despise your feast days, and I will not smell in your solemn assembly. Though you offer me burnt offerings and your meat offerings, I will not accept them, neither will I regard the peace offerings or your fat beasts. Take thou away from me the noise of your songs, for I will not hear the melody of your vials. But let judgment run down as waters and righteousness as a mighty stream. He's telling the people of Israel here, he's saying, as long as you're playing games with me, I'm not interested in what you have to say. I'm not interested. I tell folks, you know, if your heart isn't right with God, don't put nothing in that box. Get your heart right with God. When, you know, when we stand up to worship and we praise God, if we're doing it for any other reason but a pure outpouring of our worship and praise to the Lord, God stops his ears. Thank you, sis. Thank you for helping me out. She pulled me out, got me out of trouble. <laughs> Thank you. Our worship, our attitude has to be pure. It has to be pure before God. It has to be for the sole purpose of lifting up the name of the Lord. When we start talking about giving and offering and all these things, it has to begin with the attitude, with the inside. Because if that doesn't get right, you know, one of, one of the reasons, and one of the reasons why we've prayed and, and do, do, do it like we do it, because when somebody comes in and they're new, I don't expect them to put any money in. If somebody comes in and maybe they don't know the Lord, maybe they, I don't expect them to give anything. Somebody comes in and they want to give something, they'll ask somebody, hey, where's the offering? But if somebody comes in and they don't know the Lord, I'm not going to tap them on the shoulder and say, hey, you know, put a basket in front of them and say, offering. Because <laughs> they don't know any better. But for those of us who know the Lord, when we bring our offering, we worship Him. He says, I'll just read on a little bit more. This is a good scripture. Thank you, sister. No, that's not it, but that's okay. Well, I know it was early in Isaiah somewhere, but I, Excuse me? Isaiah 3? Okay. Let's check it out. Thank you. You're helping me out. Everybody get me out of trouble this morning. All right. Isaiah chapter 3 and verse 24. I knew it was up there somewhere. Okay. Uh, and it shall come to pass that instead of a sweet smell there shall be a stink 
And instead of a girdle or rent, and instead of well, uh, set hair, uh, well set hair baldness, and instead of stomacher, a grinding of sackcloth and burning instead of beauty. God is saying, instead of that sweet smelling savor that I receive from people that worship me in spirit and truth, it will be a stench in my nostrils. See, the attitude is important. Thank you, Dior. The attitude is important. Now, I want you to look. We're going to turn to the New Testament, okay? And, uh, Look at 2 Corinthians. Chapter 9. Okay. This is all about giving. And by the way, you know, we give of our time, we give of our energy, we give our, of, of our, you know, that's good. But this is, this is about money. Okay, it's about cash. Because you know what, we, I could put all the time I want to into doing what I'm doing, but when the gas bill comes and I, I, and I send them a letter and say, well, I gave my time, they say, listen, we don't need that gas. All right. <laughs> you know, the next time... Next time your mortgage comes due, you know, just write them up and say, hey, well, look, I've been working. I've been, I've been giving stuff away. Okay, so look at chapter 9. Paul is writing this letter to the church of Corinth. For as touching the ministering to the saints, it is superfluous that for me to write to you. For I know the forwardness of your mind, for which I boast of you to them in Macedonia and Achaia, uh, was ready a year ago, and your zeal has provoked very many. What he's saying here is, when Paul was in Corinth, he told them he wanted to raise an offering for the poor people in Macedonia. Because the church in Macedonia was struggling. It was another part of, uh, northern part of Greece. So he says, we're going to raise an offering. And the Corinthians were, 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 were for it. And he says, I have sent the brethren, lest our boasting of you should be made in vain, that as I said, you may be ready. Lest haply, if they of Macedonia come with me and find you unprepared, that we say uh, not you, should be ashamed in this same confident boasting. He's saying, you promised you were going to do it, now do it. Okay. So obviously what was happening was they said they were going to take an offering and never did. So Paul said, well, you know, I'm sending some of the brethren to see you guys to, you know, take this offering that you said you were going to take. Watch when you make a vow. If you're going to make a vow to God for something, you better be ready to fulfill it. Amen? Amen? Whether it's money, whether it's whatever. If you're going to make a vow, you, you, God, holds us, God holds us to our vows. Even more than the bank does. <laughs> you can get out of paying the bank, but you ain't going to get out of paying God. He doesn't have chapter 11 going. Okay. All right. No. All right. Therefore I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren that they would go before you and make up beforehand your bounty or your giving, whereof you had noticed before that the same might be ready. But this I say in verse 6, He which sows sparingly, and we, we need to write this down, and I am not, I'm so sick and tired of hearing people talk about planting seeds. Come on. You turn on Christian TV today half the time, somebody's like, plant your seed, sow your seed, plant your seed, sow your seed. I'm so sick of hearing about seed planting. If you are going to sow an offering, you better know where you're sowing it. These folks on TV, you don't know what they're doing with your money. Well, you do know what they're doing with your money. They're buying Mercedes with it. They're buying jets. I don't, give me, I'm not going to start on it. He said, he which sows sparingly shall also reap sparingly. If you're, if you're frugal with your giving unto God, how can you expect God to bless you? And it doesn't have to be money for money. Okay, God's blessing doesn't have to be, you know, if I give $10, you're going to give me a file. It doesn't have to be that. But how can you expect to live a blessed life if you're not willing to take what God has already given you and worship Him with it? Because when you give money to a church, or give money to a charity, you're worshiping, if you're doing it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you're worshiping God. Paul says, he which sows sparingly shall reap sparingly, and he which sows bountifully shall reap bountifully. That's pretty clear, isn't it? Every man according as he purposes in his heart, and here he is, 
So let him give, not grudgingly. I'll give him money. If you've got to grit your teeth when you put money in the box, don't put anything in it. I'm just telling you, keep it. For all the good it is. Do you think you're going to get a blessing because you get up here and grit your teeth and say, God, here's my offering. Just keep it. So let him give not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. That means hilarious. That means you, if you can give and be grateful and thankful and just be hilarious about it, oh, hallelujah. God loves that. He loves that. When His people can part with stuff and give it and say hallelujah. He loves it. Reading just a little bit more. And God is able to make all grace, look at verse 8, God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. God is able to give you everything you need. He's, he's able to give you everything you need to, to live in this life. He's, he's able to give you everything you need to live well. If you're willing to worship Him with your stuff. With your stuff. With your money. As it is written, He has dispersed abroad. He has given to the poor. His righteousness remains forever. Now he that ministers seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food and multiply your seed sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. If you give, he'll give you more stuff to give. If you're faithful. Remember the parable that Jesus told about the, the, the servants? He gave one ten talents and one five and one one. And the one that had ten invested in them got ten more. And the one that had five invested in them got five more. And the one that had one, he just buried it in the ground. God expects us to use what we have, not only money-wise, but talent-wise, ability. Whatever God has given us, He expects us to use it for His glory. And when we do, we, you know, it's a risk. When you give, and let's face it, when you give money to a church or to a ministry, it's a risk. You're taking money out of your pocket and putting it in an offering box. But if you're willing to trust God, He'll bless your offering. He'll bless you. Reading just a little bit more. Maybe just one more passage. Turn with me to Hebrews. Uh, Hebrews chapter 13. And look at verse... It's talking about offering. Um, look at verse. Uh, well, we can just go all the way. Let's just go to verse one. Let brotherly love continue. Okay, Hebrews chapter thirteen. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for they uh, thereby. Some have entertained angels unaware. Remember them that are in bonds as bound with them, and them which suffer adversity as being yourselves also in the body. He's saying, remember those that have need. Be willing to meet those that have a genuine need. Marriage is honorable in all, the bed undefiled, the whoremongers, the adulterers, God will judge. Let your lifestyle, your conversation be without covetousness. Be without covetousness. What is covetousness? The love of money. It's easy to fall in love with money, isn't it? You can do a lot of stuff with money. I mean, money's just a tool. It's just there. It's easy to fall. The more you get, the more you get to like it. Hey. But he says, make sure, examine your lives, that you're not living a life where you're desiring more. See, we, I went to my preaching message that in America, we worship a God called more. We want more. I gotta have more, more, more. I gotta have more house, more car, more money, more this, more that. He said, 
don't, don't be covetous. Be content with such things as you... This is not, this, this kind of teaching does not go over good with the United Steelworkers. Amen. I was a member of the United Steelworkers for 33 years. And when you would say stuff like this when it came around contract time, you were not a popular person. Be content with such things as you have. I, ask yourself this question. I wasn't going to read that this morning, but let's read. Uh, look around. What you got? Are you content? How many people here can say, I'm content? That doesn't mean, we're not talking about, you know, if you get an opportunity to, to, to better yourself, that's fine. We're not talking about, you know, being able to better yourself education-wise. That's fine. But if, if somebody were to ask you today, are you content with where you are? With where God has placed you, where, where God has you right now, are you content? See, now, 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 don't get mad at me. But a lot of people will tell me, yeah, I'm content. Then I'll hear them complain. If you ever complain, okay. This is that's quiet this morning. I know, I knew it was going to be. That's all right. I'm just giving what God gave me. God confirmed it by about two or three different people. This is the message for this morning. He said, be content with such things as you have why? Why should I be content with what I got? Why shouldn't I want a bigger car? Why shouldn't I want a house up on a hill? Why shouldn't I want more? Why? Because he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. I was reading in the paper. They're, you know, Allegheny Ludlam, they're up, they have contract. They've got a contract coming up. And I'm retired from there. So I don't get to vote on it. I just have to live with what passes. Okay. And I read, I read the, the article, and it's nothing official yet, but they're saying, oh, you know, health care costs for retirees might double or triple. I'm thinking, I'm a retiree. I start to think, they're gonna put up my and I and inside you know how you get when you start thinking Brr, and it's like the Lord said you know what I'm your helper I'm your God I said I'll never leave you nor forsake you so they're gonna put up your health care costs well hey who am I God listen I don't have to I don't have to complain about what the United Steel workers are going to do with my health care costs why because the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. I don't care if they're going to get rid of Social Security. I don't care if they're going to get rid of Medicare. I do care, but I don't care. Because my God, the Lord is my helper. If they pull out everything, I'm just going to have to depend more on Him. Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. Be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines. Oh, there's a lot here. Let's just, just jump down. Uh, uh, look at verse, uh, look for verse 10. We have an altar whereof they have no right to eat, which serve the tabernacle. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people was, with his own blood, suffered without the gate. He's making a comparison to the Old Testament law. Let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. For we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. Verse 15. By him therefore, by Christ, all that I read just to get down here, and I'm, I'm missing so much. By him therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise. Remember when we said the very first worship in the Bible was with what? A sacrifice. With money, when we talk about praise, uh, or with music rather, when we talk about praise, we think praise and worship, we think music, but yeah, and that's good. We praise and worship God, we like the music, but he's talking about something different here. He's talking about the sacrifice of praise. Let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. But to do good and to communicate, forget not, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. That means it's one, we worship Him with our words, but then we worship Him with our stuff.
stuff. Okay. I'm closing. This has not been a revival fire message. Yes, sir. Read it. be a wealthy person that, that passage that brother read and all them rich Pharisees they were coming in they were throwing in they were putting they would tithe they would count if they had ten seeds they would take one out put it in. they were meticulous but their heart wasn't right but that widow that old woman she had a couple coins and I'm sure I'm sure them Pharisees probably looked at that and said but God looked at it and it was a sweet smelling safe. How much do you want to worship God? This isn't a message about getting you to give more money. This is a message about your relationship with Him and how you express it. My good friend Harold Malise says this all the time. If you want to know how spiritual somebody is, look at their Bible and look at their wallet. I want to pray this morning. We're going to close. And again, this isn't one of those revival, you know, jumping and shouting messages. But this is a message that will bless your life if you listen to it. If you learn how to worship God with your stuff, watch what He'll do. I didn't pull Malachi out. I might do that next week. You know what old Malachi said? He says, why are you bringing, why are you bringing your lame and you're, why are you bringing the second or third best or you're rejected? He said, would you give that to the government? You know what? The, the government, they take theirs off the top. When I used to get paid over Allegheny Ludlam, the first thing that was on that first line was, you know, federal income tax. Try to give the government your second best and see what happens. Uh, well, maybe, maybe we'll talk about Malachi next week. Everybody will stay home. It's all right. How many people, you want to be blessed, blessed of God? You want to be a blessing? I want to pray. And we're going to close. And this isn't one of those, you know, warm, fuzzy, cold, chill messages. This is down-to-earth message. This is where the rubber meets the road. Sometimes we get so caught up in the... Mm -hmm, and we forget about... I want you all to be blessed. I'm not trying to get no money off you. I don't, I, don't, I don't operate like that. I want you to be blessed. Father, stand with me. Father, I know that the word this morning has been one of those messages. It's not, it's not like the ice cream at the end of the meal but it was the it was the, the pastor spencer used to say sometimes you get the meat and sometimes you get the bone yeah. father i know the message this morning was not a yelling shouting jumping message but father it's it's your message it's from your word father you desire those who will worship you in spirit and in truth and father all through your word you talk about bringing an offering making a sacrifice in worship not to make somebody rich, not to uh, make yourself look good, but Father, to, 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 to bring an offering and a sacrifice to worship you with our stuff, to saying, as, as if we're saying unto you, we know that you're, you control our finances. We know that you control our bank book. We know that you control the economy. We know, Lord, that if we're faithful to worship you with just what you've given us, that you will bless us, you'll keep us. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever, and we don't have to be afraid what anybody says or what anybody does. Father, I pray that my words this morning, that your word this morning, 
given in such a disjointed, humble, feeble way will touch somebody's heart and you'll make them realize that you receive worship from a pure heart. Father, I pray, Lord, for those, there might be those who have never, never even considered making financial offerings to the body of Christ. Whether it be this one or another one. I, a place where your word is being preached. A place where, where people are, are, are hearing your word and being touched and being saved and being healed. Father, I pray there might be some people that have never considered. Father, I pray you will help us consider worshiping you. We worship you in song and in dance and in, in prayer. Father, I pray you will help us Worship you with our giving, with our stuff. Because that's part of the program. Lord, I thank you that you have provided for us over these almost 20 years. We have never been without in this body. We have never been, we have never had to scrape or scrimp or beg or milk for money. We've never had to do that. We've never had to have a bake sale. We've never had to have a rummage sale. We've never had to do any of that stuff because you have provided. Because you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we don't have to be afraid what man will do to us. Let him take away the tax exemption. It doesn't matter, Lord. We don't have to be afraid. Because we're your people. We belong to you. And everything we have came from you. Father, I pray you will help us make a decision this morning. As individuals, between us and you, individuals, one-on-one. -on -one, that we will begin to pray that you would give us faith to be able to worship you with our stuff. Even if we start small, maybe we don't have the faith to bring a tithe. Maybe it will be less than that. As we start small and you'll show yourself faithful, I pray God, not for my sake or for the sake of the church, but for the sake of everybody within the sound of my voice, that they hear your voice. And they'll step out in faith and prove you. And say, I'm going to give you my stuff. Now, Lord, here I am. Father, help us be content with the stuff that we got. Help us be thankful that you have us where we're at. Father, if you want us to move up, you'll show us that. You'll show us those ways. Father, if you open up doors for us to improve our lot, that's important. We want to do that. But, Father, if this is where you have us right now, then whatever level we're at, Father, we want to be content here financially. Father, we want to worship you and give you glory because you're worthy. You're worthy. You're worthy, God. You're worthy, Father. It doesn't matter what the economy is going to do. It doesn't matter what the job does. It doesn't matter what the union votes on. It doesn't, that doesn't matter. You're my God. You're our God. You own the cattle on a thousand hills. It all belongs to you anyhow. Father, we're trusting you, and we're giving you glory. In Jesus' name. I wonder if we could just close with that song once again. My soul finds rest in God.